Welcome to Space Floor NBA Podcast. My name is Connor Gielen. And I'm Connor Flannery. And this is our 55th official episode, and it is our first official Zoom episode. We're both in quarantine, chilling in the crib, but basically what we're talking about today is the Chicago Bulls. They kind of demoted slash got rid of their two GMs. One's a vice president of basketball operation, one's a GM, but basically the two guys in charge of making all the basketball decisions in Chicago, they no longer are going to have the jobs that they have. There's some dispute whether they they might still have influence, but bottom line, they hired this other dude. And what we're trying to figure out today is like, what does this mean? And also like, who were these dudes? Like, why were they so bad? Yeah. um, And so, so with the end or supposed end of the Garpax era in Chicago, um, we sort of thought we'd start the episode by figuring out how did we get to today. Um, and so it will be one thing to just start right off by saying, what, what do they do now? What, how, what does the future look like for the Chicago Bulls? But we think um, that an even better way to start would just be, how did we get to the point where essentially the entire Chicago Bulls fan base was against Gar Foreman and John Paxson, wanted them out, and, was, and had shirts and things that said, fire Gar Pax. Um, so how do we get to that point? And, and then we're going to end with where do they go from now with this new management? Exactly. So let's start with the history of Gar Foreman and John Paxton as the two Bulls tyrants. Um, well, John Paxton, for context, he was hired as a general manager for Chicago Bulls in 2003. And he, if, you, if you only know the name from the Chicago Bulls in terms of playing, that's probably – the better John Paxton, just because he was like a starting point guard on a lot of those Jordan teams that did really well. Um, so he's, he's pretty widely regarded around the league. Um, and he becomes a general manager in 2003 after he retired and went into broadcasting. And when I was just doing my research for this, I didn't know that he was a broadcaster and then went straight to the general manager role, not even an assistant. And for me, that just like, I was like, that, that does not seem, that does not seem right. There's one thing to be like, like a coach after you become a broadcaster because you're near basketball every night. But I feel like it's different with, with the general manager, you know? I mean, it's never a good sign. We've seen it with players, for example, before too. Um, Isaiah Thomas, who came and and became the GM of the Knicks. Um, When you have somebody who doesn't really have any experience in the management role, just stepping right in as the like head executive of your franchise, that's not usually a good sign. That doesn't mean that every decision that John Paxson made was bad, but it does mean that starting 2003, he was running most things for the Chicago Bulls and had a lack of experience. Yeah, exactly. And so he beca- he actually became the vice president of basketball operations in 2009 when Gar Foreman comes in uh, and, and takes kind of the lead role as the general manager in 2009. And like originally just like I think around the league, the, the most important thing that you should get out of this if you're listening to this is that around the league, just just as like a, a young person who didn't follow the Bulls in like the late 2000s um, or the mid 2000s is that I just kind of through osmosis kind of just assumed that Gar Pax was always horrible at their job. Um, they, they just had no idea what they were doing and they were just like a, like the Knicks, basically. They just horribly managed. Um, and that's not entirely true. I think the, the main thing that stood out to me is that Gar Foreman won executive of the year in 2010. Uh, and I, can't, I, can't, I couldn't believe that. But, uh, like, it makes sense. But like, I couldn't believe that given that everyone around the league is like, oh, yeah, Gar Foreman, he's, he's horrible at his job. He has no idea what he's doing. He's a bumbling idiot. But executive of the year, they give that like once a year. Like the past like few winners have been – uh, John Horace of the Bucks, Bob Myers of the Warriors, R.C. Buford of the Spurs, Masai Ujiri of the Raptors, like the best of the best. And he's in that category. So I, I think that that's the most important thing to start. It's not all bad. And we'll see that a bit more as we go through the history of Garpax to kind of just understand why the Bulls have been where they've been for the past five years, 10 years, and 15 years. So here we got highlighted um, some of the most important moves that they have made um, throughout their tenure, basically starting 2003 up to the present. So I guess 17, 18 different seasons. Um, but, but I guess we'll start off with the draft. And so in 2003, um, in the first year of the Garpax era, they took Kirk Heinrich seventh overall. 
Um, in hindsight, not, not horrible because actually if you look on basketball reference, um, I was earlier today, they list the top uh, 12 players in a franchise history. If you follow us on Twitter, I, t- I tweeted that out today. I'll, Kirk you, Heinrich d- is like the 10th player on that list for the Bulls because he has the 10th most win shares for the Bulls franchise in their history. Do you know who's not on that list? Who? Derrick Rose. That's a good point. Derrick Rose is not on that <laughs> list. And so no surprise, like Jordan Pippen were number one, number two, but Kirk Heinrich found, him, found his way on there at like number 10. So even though I wouldn't say that Kirk Heinrich is, didn't have like an incredible NBA career, never made an all-star team, never made all-NBA team, anything like that, um, I don't think he was necessarily a terrible pick for his seventh overall. Um, mediocre. Yeah, agreed. Um, but then following that up in 2004, um, they took Ben Gordon third overall. Um, and for, for certain stretches of time, Ben Gordon went healthy, lo- looked up, like, looked like he was going to fill up all of that hype that he had to, to be a third overall pick caliber guy. Um, unfortunately his career doesn't sort of match that, um, that uh, potential that he showed at some, at some times, but, but that's mostly because of injuries. Um, and so this is sort of the first, I would say, like miss in the draft for guard packs, but I wouldn't say it's their own fault because of Ben Gordon's injuries. Exactly. Like I hate when people like call Greg Oden a bus. And mm. it's like, no, he probably would have been good. He just got injured and no front office can see that. That's different than like just picking a genuinely bad player who just can't really play basketball at the next level. Definitely. Um, what, what, one other thing. This one. Yeah. One other thing I would I would like to just establish here is that if you're thinking that, okay, we're talking about the 2003 and 2004 drafts, uh, uh, Gar Foreman wasn't even there yet because he became, he rose to his job in 2009. That's not true. And especially like for the, for the draft is especially important because even though he wasn't uh, like the general manager, he worked his way up through scouting. Um, And so like, especially through the draft uh, in the, in the early years, uh, Gar Foreman definitely still like had some sort of impact in in who they decided to draft because he he like his field individually was scouting. Um, next up on the list we have Tyrus Thomas. They took him in two thousand six. Uh, fourth overall, yeah, fourth overall. And now, the only reason <laughs> most people know this name is because he's the guy that the Bulls traded for Lamarcus Aldridge. So the Bulls originally had the second overall pick, traded the draft rights to Lamarcus Aldridge for the fourth overall pick, which became Tyrus Thomas. Now and we'll get, we'll go a little bit deeper <laughs> into that trade when we get to the trade section, but obviously that is a huge mistake given the career that Marcus Aldridge has put together. But Tyrus Thomas, the fourth overall pick is a miss regardless. Yeah. Complete bust. Okay. Um, moving on to the next one in 2007, the following year, um, the Bulls took Joakim Noah ninth overall. Obviously um, if you know anything about the Bulls recent history, Joakim Noah was a hugely impactful player for the Chicago Bulls teams that made it deep into the Eastern Conference playoffs. Um, became a defensive player of the year candidate, even finished third in MVP voting one year. Um, and so alongside Derrick Rose was, uh, you know, were, were, they were the two most important pieces on some really, really good Chicago Bulls teams. Yeah, and I, I just think that that's definitely a huge W that I honestly – I never really thought when considering like, are these two like good general managers, like taking, taking a, an all NBA player, an all-star at the ninth overall pick, like, like that's good, you know, like, cause like usually like one, two, three overall picks are like pretty safe. But like after you get like five, like you're kind of just taking stabs for all stars. And for, for, uh, for reference, the Knicks, I guess around the, the eighth, ninth pick the last few years have taken Frank Nielakina and Kevin Knox, who by no means live up to the Joakim Noah standards that guard, <laughs> that guard packs have here. Um, and so I, obviously we're both Knicks fans. So that's the example that comes to my mind, but as a point of reference, um, it's not, it's not easy. It, it's not a shoe in to get it's a not star. a given. Exactly. Um, 2008, they took Derek Rose, um, got super lucky in the lottery um, Derek Rose was viewed as some of a can't miss prospect um, at first overall. Um, so uh, the only, the only, I guess, thing that you would give them props here for, other than just like 
the luck of the lottery is that they didn't go with Michael Beasley at second as with as a first overall pick because he was taken second. Um, and so they could have really messed up if they took Michael Beasley over uh, Derek Rose. But here they made the right the right pick. They had nobody picking in front of them. So yeah, they had. They also just fun fact they had like a one point seven percent chance of getting the first overall pick, like that uh, for Derek Rose, and then also. I think the Kyrie Irving first overall pick, I think the Clippers originally had that pick and like they were like, they just missed the playoffs. So they had traded the the pick because they were like, Oh yeah, it'll be like the 14th overall pick. And it had like the 14, I don't know the exact number, but it had like a 1% chance of getting first overall. And then the Cavs had that pick and then they, they got Kyrie Irving. That's like a good NBA trivia for you. As like a, as like a little side piece to loot to losing LeBron. Um, all right, and so then in 2009, the next year, they took Taj Gibson 26th overall. Um, obviously, Taj Gibson did not become the same player that Joe Kim Noah did, but in a similar way, great value for where he was taken. Basically, at the end of the first round, find Taj Gibson, who became a really, really solid starter for the Chicago Bulls, is great value, just to put it very simply. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I, I think we can just leave it off of that. Uh, next up, they took... Jimmy Butler with a 30th overall pick in 2011. This is probably Obviously, the highlight of their yeah, like ab- recent draft history. Absolutely. The last 30th pick of overall. the first round, taking a guy who is an all-NBA all-star player, is even the best player on one of the better teams in the Eastern Conference right now. Um, Jimmy Butler, at points of his career, has been definitely top 20, arguably top 15 player in the NBA. Um, so... Obviously, this is a hugely successful pick. Um, great scouting, whatever it was from uh, from Garpax here. I, I was looking at his basketball reference and his prime with the Bulls, like the, like the prime years that like the Bulls like got Jimmy Butler value. I guess was only three years, which which was a little surprising when I consider him take like, a while to to like yeah. come into himself. Yeah, he played like five or six years with them. But the first two years were kind of bad yeah yeah um, I, I was i was watching this is random tangent but i was watching uh the jj reddick podcast with jimmy butler that man's entertaining bro like you can tell like jj reddick like, or jimmy butler Jim, jimmy butler both of them honestly but i i highly recommend the jj reddick podcast but like if like i feel like if if jimmy butler's teammates don't hate him they love him so all right that, that's i would just leave it, at that. it yeah. yeah um okay so next up We got this that same year, Doug McDermott taken 11th overall. Um, Obviously, even like 20 picks higher, they got a much worse player. Um, Doug McDermott recently is actually a pretty solid role player for the Pacers coming off the bench, but never became, I don't think, anything super special for the Bulls, um, even taking 11th overall. But what's really bad here was the trade that he was involved in. Um, But we'll get to that a little bit later. Yeah. Um, the next one, uh, we're skipping a five years ahead here, um, really getting into super recent memory. In 2016, they took Denzel Valentine with the final pick in the lottery, 14th overall. Um, this one I think was interesting because um, I remember Denzel Val- watching Denzel Valentine play at Michigan State. Um, and, and I thought that he would be a pretty good pick for, at the end of the lottery, but – still has sort of just bounced back and forth in the G League and really hasn't turned it into anything. Um, yeah, and I mean, part of that is injuries. Minutes. Part of that is injuries, but part of that's like just not being like that, that outstanding. I think like his his ceiling would be like a 3 and D role player that can occasionally take it off the bounce. But like mm. he hasn't given the Bulls significant value. So as of now, not a good pick by Garpax. And I would, and I would just say that like this is where we start to get into the zone of like, when we're talking about how did we get to today, now we're really getting into like the last few years, some of the more recent moves that they've made. And so this is where it really is like the differentiator, I guess, in like why they are being demoted, why they're being pushed out. Um, and, and I guess this is sort of the point where Bulls fans start to turn on Garpax. Um, and then the following year, they took Justin Patton, uh, 16th overall. Justin Patton, like – Hardly even know that name, and yeah, same. Was drafted I, just I literally, the lottery. I don't know a position Justin Patton plays. I think he's a big. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, the year after that, so this is two years ago now. 
um, Wendell Carter seventh overall. And then just last year, Kobe White also seventh overall. Those two picks are actually looking pretty good. Um, I would say there wasn't a lot better um, like alternatives drafted right around them. Um, and so I think that Bulls fans should be pretty happy with those, with those picks. I think they, they, they are both showing um, strong potential as members of that core the Chicago Bills are building right now. Yeah. And like, I feel like, like Knicks, can't, like Knicks fans, like we complain a lot. Right. But like, I feel like the specific cries from the Bulls fans about Gar packs is a little like it seems like a little over dramatic in terms of like drafting because like before this we've seen like the Bulls made the playoffs 10 out of 11 times from like 2005 to 2015 and so for the past five years they've they've only made the playoffs we'll get more into this but the past five years they've they've only made the playoffs once so it's like okay yeah they're bad so their like main important thing is the draft and so I could understand like being upset if if you're just team your team is horrible at drafting right but at least the past few years, like they've been fine enough, you know, whereas like we, we, we took Frank Nelkina, who I, I think like, I, I still believe in, um, but yeah. we took Frank Nelkina and, and uh, Kevin Knox, you know, like, I, I feel like if, if that was happening to the Bulls fans, like Chicago would explode, bro. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's probably a pretty fair point. Um, all right, but now let's hop over to the trades from the draft. So we worked our way all the way up through the draft from 2003 to 2019. Um, but let's hop, hop all the way back towards 2003 um, to the early moves of John Paxson and uh, Gar Foreman. Just, just to give us a context of like, were these guys like horrible at making trades? Were these guys good at making trades? How, how did their trades kind of affect Chicago in their success and in their failures? Yeah, um, so the first one we've got here, um, and once again, these are only the trades that we picked out as having like a significant influence on the Bulls franchise, right? Positive or negative. Exactly. Yeah. So, so just like somebody you've never heard of for a second round pick is not a trade that would make this list because it didn't have a huge impact either way. Um, all right. But here we got Jamal Crawford, Jerome Williams to the New York Knicks for Othella Harrington to Kevin Matumbo, Cesare Trubansky and Frank Williams. This one I put on this list because Jamal Crawford, of course, became a sixth man of the year um, and was a very lethal score off the bench for the New York Knicks, um, something that really the Chicago Bulls could have used. And so it's a little bit disappointing that they, they would trade him away. Um, and in return, they got the biggest name. The only name that I recognize is Dikembe Mutombo. Um, and at this point, Dikembe Mutombo was no longer Ancient. in his prime. Yeah. Um, yeah. and they actually traded to Kemba Matumbo that same year, I think only a few months later. Um, and so they, they pretty quickly flipped to Kemba Matumbo. So it was sort of like they gave Jamal Crawford up for nothing. Yeah. And I think a trend that we're going to see is like Garpax likes to trade for big names who are no longer big talents. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Next one. Um, Going back to the LaMarcus Aldridge for Tyrus Thomas flip, um, the Bulls traded the draft rights to the LaMarcus Aldridge, the second overall pick, and a second round pick to the Portland Trailblazers for the draft rights of Tyrus Thomas, the fourth overall pick, in Victor Kiapa, um, or Karipa. I don't, I don't know how to pronounce it. And, and no one. No exactly. One. I'm sure he's um, a nice guy, but no. <laughs> a, a no one for all intents and purposes um, in, in this, in this like, how do we get to today? Um, but Obviously, LaMarcus Aldridge is a hugely important name in the How Do We Get to Today because he is a franchise-altering piece that has gone on to be... Yeah, he's he's gone on to be one of the best players of the last decade. Um, One of the the best power forwards in the league for the last however many years, basically since he's been been drafted. Um, And so to give him to the Portland Trailblazers for uh, uh, the fourth overall pick that became zero and somebody we've never heard of is really really probably the biggest mistake we have here yeah devastating definitely and um so a few years later the the bulls ended up drafting Derek rose so you could have been looking at something like joe keep noah Derek rose and um and lamarcus aldridge but there i did see an article that basically questioned like 
Would LaMarcus Aldridge have led to more wins? Would the Bulls still have been able to draft Derrick Rose? But then there's something more complicated, which is like, if you're running with that like 1.7% chance of the lottery, it would still just come down to the luck of the draw with those, you know, like lottery balls. So who knows? Um, but then the next one we've got is um, trading Eddie Curry, Antonio Davis, and a first round pick to the New York Knicks for Jermaine Jackson, Mike Sweetney, Tim Thomas, a first round pick that became Marcus Aldridge, a first round pick that became Joakim Noah, and two second round picks. This one um, haunts the memory of Knicks fans a little bit, um, but it is noteworthy here because they got the two first round picks that became LaMarcus Aldridge and Joakim Noah for, uh, for Eddie Curry and Antonio Davis, who were both aging at that point. Yeah, again, just huge, huge W for the Chicago Bulls, one of the crowning achievements of guard packs. If, if they had kept the pick and, and gotten mm-hmm. Aldridge, this would look incredible. Yeah. Cause like, it's still like in value. If you look at it objectively, it is still incredible, but like it doesn't look as like shiny and sweet because they don't, they don't have the success of LaMarcus, LaMarcus Aldridge to show for it, you know? Agreed. Yeah. Um, but they bank robbed the next <laughs> highway right. robbery. Next one. Uh, they traded Tyson Chandler to the, Wor- the, to the new Orleans Hornets for PJ Brown and J.R. Smith. Um, so was this like what like after a, a, a year of Tyson Chandler or was this like on draft night mm, it, it was, it was sure. a very young it was, not, it was a very young Tyson Chandler yes um now this but it's it's of course very noteworthy because once again this is a piece that could have really helped out on some of their Derrick Rose led teams that made deep playoff runs if you had an extra Tyson Chandler or LaMarcus Aldridge, those are teams that could potentially could have won the finals. Now, you could also say that if Derrick Rose had stayed healthy, but that's a different question. I mean, this is, this is another chance that they, that they had to surround Derrick Rose with players who went on to accumulate numerous accolades, right? We know that Tyson Chandler went on to become a defensive player of the year, um, an all-star, and a really, really valuable center. Exactly. And, and like, you could argue, it's like, oh, yeah, great. They got J.R. Smith out of it. He's a scorer. He's a bucket. He's a sixth man. However, <laughs> they went on to flip J.R. Smith. The very next trade on our list. <laughs> the very next trade on our list is they flip J.R. Smith to the Denver Nuggets for Howard Easley. No idea. Um, no idea who that is. And two second round picks that – are not relevant that that will get lost in history um yeah so basically they traded tyson chandler rim, rim protecting legend defensive player of the year good rim runner all that in exchange for two seconds and howard easily who that's just kind of like a zero yeah it, um, like it's it's a good pick but they just kind of don't do anything with it um moving along um Kyle Corver to the Atlanta Hawks for, and here's where this gets really interesting, Cash. Dude, Cash is my favorite player, bro. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> He's nice. You mean they didn't get a player? They didn't get a pick? No, they just got Cash for future all-star Kyle Corver. One of the best three-point shooters of all time. One of the leader, league leaders over his career in three-pointers made, three-point percentage. What did they get? No, just, just Cash. Yeah, um, bro. They, you just, gar packs, just they extra, got a big budget, bro. They exactly. got to live lavish. They just, got to live uh, lavish. Put some extra dollars in the in the wallet. But this one, this one is really shocking because it's just like, how do you get nothing? Like, just money? Like that's it? Yeah, we um, saw. I think it was TJ, TJ Warren got traded for cash this off season, and everyone was like flaming the same Suns. Thing. Same thing. Yeah, TJ exactly. Warren is like a, like an eighteen point per game scorer. What are you doing? Um, but really, it's like the the Chicago Bulls are what a, like a two billion dollar franchise. That's a total estimate, but like they're one of the more. most valued okay, franchises. More. The next, yeah, the yeah. Knicks are four four billion. Well, that gets complicated because because of MSG and because there are more yeah. than one team that play in MSG. Okay. Anyway, but the Chicago Bulls are are anyway one of the most valued franchises in the NBA. They're never going to struggle to put fans in the seats. Why are they worried about just some cash? Um, yeah, you can sell <laughs> badminton in Chicago and it'll sell. 
because there are so many people and people love sports. All right. Um, so then here we come back to the Doug McDermott trade that I mentioned earlier. So the Doug McDermott 11th overall, not the worst thing in the world, but it's really ugly when you read this trade. Yusuf Nurkic, the 19th overall pick, and Gary Harris, the 16th overall pick, for Doug McDermott and Anthony Randolph on draft night. Now, the Gary Harris and Yusuf Nurkic that we know today are both a whole lot better than Doug McDermott, I would argue. Doug um, McDermott's on like a $5 million contract, and Yusuf Nurkic and Gary Harris combined are making like like <laughs> $50 million a year. <laughs> oh, oh. I, I, so, so, I mean, like when you're looking – we, I mean, people were ta- are talking about, like, if the Portland Trailblazers had Yusuf Nurkic in last year's, you know, Western Conference Finals, it would have looked a lot different. I mean, people talk about, like, Gary Harris is going to be one of the most important pieces in the Nuggets, like, future potentially, like, NBA championship contending teams. And then you have Doug McDermott, who's, like, bouncing around from team to team, barely – I mean, barely stayed in the NBA – um, and now has solidified himself as a great role player, but but the, those two guys shadow. like yeah like yeah Yusuf Yusuf Nurkic is an elite rebounder. He's a pretty decent like rim runner and post scorer. And then Gary Harris is like if he rectifies his jump shot, which I think he which I think he can. He has like good form, good flow, all that stuff. Uh, if he if he can fix his jumper, he's going to be one of the best three and D guys in the league because he can also he can also go off the dribble. Personally, like. like it, I I am not particularly a fan of the Denver backcourt because they kind of overlap in the same strengths and weaknesses. But if Gary Harris was just allowed to kind of like do his thing, I think that like he could just go off the dribble, be a good three and D guy and just be like very serviceable. And I think that if you put those two guys on the bulls right now, have them develop the bulls, like, like they would be decent. Like they, there wouldn't be all this rumbling and they definitely would just be like respectable to say the least. I mean, those two guys together are just a very solid foundation is that is just yeah. like a simple way to put it. Um, so those are guys that every NBA team wants mm. and every Chicago Bulls president wants to give away. So then next up we have the trade of Luol Deng to the Cleveland Cavaliers for Andrew By- Bynum, three second round picks, and then some more complex pick options that I didn't feel like reading out loud. Um, basically it was like they get a first round pick if this happens and there's this team is a bottom 12 team but then it's a second round pick that swaps with this team if this happens it got really weird but anyway the, the biggest point in this trade is that Luol Dang was very very good as um, as a wing guy for the for the Chicago Bulls for a long period of time and they traded him in 2015 for Andrew Bynum who at one point was supposed to be one of the most promising centers in the league for the Los Angeles Lakers, but very quickly fell off the face of the earth. And this was after that falling off of the face of the earth. Um, and so to trade Luol Deng for Andrew Bynum in hindsight is very clearly a mistake. I had no idea that Andrew Bynum played for the Bulls. Yeah. I don't think it lasted. <laughs> um, I think that's why. Um, so unless you have anything to say about that, um, no, I'm going I'm to move on to, um, they traded Justin Holiday, Derek Rose, in a second-round pick um, to the New York Knicks for Jose Calderon, Jerry and Grant, and Robin Lopez. <laughs> Dude, that's <laughs> those those three <laughs> those three names made me laugh because they're like a combined like zero, <laughs> like at the at the time and now. Because like Robin Lopez, is, like he's a fine backup center, it's whatever. But like, and he he, he was a starter for the Bulls for like two years, but like. He wasn't a good starter for the Bulls. I know, like, a, a lot of people on NBA Twitter were like, "Can Robin Lopez like, like, do anything right? <laughs> Can like do anything right?" Because like, he, he was just like kind of blah. And then you give away like Derrick Rose. And, this, and then I don't. I for some reason I recently saw the video of Derrick Rose finding out that he got traded to the New York Knicks from the Chicago Bulls resurface. Um, and I think that it speaks volumes about this move because. He was crying, right, and, and 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 he was describing his feelings as shock, um, and so I think well, a lot of players would be excited to go play for the New York Knicks and play in MSG. Derrick Rose felt betrayed by his city, by Gar Garpax, um, because Chicago, 
Chicago made him who he was. And in return, he made Chicago into the teams that they were for a few years. Um, he won an MVP for them. And, and he continued – it was a very strong Chicago Bulls legacy as a franchise. Um, it really put, put together some legendary memories. Um, and, and so so when you say, like, they got back zero, there is an argument to be made that they weren't giving up all that much when they traded Derrick Rose and Justin Holiday because – the player that we know Derrick Rose has come back as the last few years where he had that 50 point game where he's in the conversation for six man of the year, where he was an almost an all-star this year. That was not the player he was coming off those injuries, right? He is, he has bounced back in a really big way. Um, but even so he went on, on the Knicks to average 18, four and four, I think. Um, and so, so to give up that, right. To seeing what he did even just a year later, it was a mistake. No, I mean, regardless of how you spin it, even if he hadn't put together that kind of production, to trade away Derrick Rose in that way feels like it's backstabbing Derrick Rose, the city of Chicago, the fans. No, Bull, all of Bulls it. fans yeah. were upset. I mean, even if Derrick Rose never played another healthy minute in the NBA, trading him away feels wrong, I think. Um, and so I think that that probably felt like a serious moment of betrayal from Gar, from Gar Pax. Um, even if Derrick Rose hadn't bounced back, I think that would have really stained their legacy in the eyes of Bulls fans. I guess what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I, I, th- I think that's very well put. Um, yeah, just betrayal, like the hometown kid. There hasn't been a Chicago athlete more beloved than Derrick Rose since Michael Jordan. Mm. Just pic- uh, yeah. picture, yeah. I think, yeah, I, yeah just, I probably agree with that. Um, and so then the next one is they traded Jimmy Butler and Justin Patton to the Minnesota Timberwolves for Chris Dunn, Zach Levine, and Laurie Markin. Um, it's been a huge W, honestly. Yeah, I was going to say the same. Um, and, and you might be thinking a little bit like, okay, but why did they trade Jimmy Butler? Because obviously we know that Jimmy Butler has become a great player in his own right. Um, because he causes locker room issues. Um, they were sort of forced to trade Jimmy Butler. It wasn't really by choice. Um, and so considering the fact that Jimmy Butler wanted out, I think they got a really great return. Um, you're looking at, in, in Laurie Markkinen and Zach Levine, the two faces of their franchise at this point. And while Chris Dunn hasn't become that and probably hasn't become what they hoped they would get as the you know recent third overall pick, um, I, he still has room to go and he's already developed into a really solid contributor off the bench just off of his defense alone. Um, we'll see if his offensive game ever gets there. Yeah, I remember watching the draft. I thought Kristen was going to be so good, bro. I don't know. He mm. just like he was like dripping with swag, and he <laughs> he just like he he just seemed to like be able to get anywhere he wanted on the court. Um, but like I'm I'm not the biggest fan of Chris Dunn in as a, as an NBA player as opposed to college. But I think that Larry Markkinen, he's going to be a great player. He's going to average over twenty in his prime. Um, that's my opinion. And Zach Levine, honestly, I was, I pride myself very heavily on knowing that Zach Levine was going to be like a bona fide bucket getter in Chicago because people were like, oh, yeah, he's not going to be able to do it. He's going to be inefficient. He, he doesn't have a blah, blah, blah. But like, I, I was just looking at the numbers. I remember like in like 2017 or 2018 or whatever. I was like, dude, this, this guy, like he, he's a shooter and like he has been a shooter for Chicago. He can, He's been able to do the pull-up threes off the catch. He's been shooting like like 40% or something like that. And even even in Minnesota, like he's this huge athletic guy, but he was shooting 40% on threes too before and after the ACL injury. So I'm, I, I'm, I was going to say, you saying that reminded me. Um, I used to do like a ton of rebuilds on like 2K15, you know, the My League mode. Mm-hmm. And the cheat code in that was a trade for Zach Levine because for whatever reason um, – he would have no trade value for the Timberwolves. You get him for basically nothing, but he would always turn into like a 90 overall who was just like a plus scoring across the board, played no defense, couldn't do anything, but was like the best dunker in the game and was like lights out from three. So I was like, I would always trade for him because he was free. Like he was free money. If you knew that Zach Levine got good, you were set in my league and like 
two K fifteen. Um, so so awesome. yeah, so I remember that. Um, all right, but but yeah, that, but that does it for that trade, I guess. Um, yeah, and honestly, that's just I just want to point out that's like a very sizable W for Gar Packs recent recently, you know. Like, there's the whole, like, oh, yeah, we, like, Bulls have sucked for the past few years, like, and it's their fault. Like, they had a tough hand, and they played it pretty well. So, I'm just going to give them props for that. I, I agree with you, because if you just look at, like, some of the, the most recent moves they've made between that trade, what they got from Jimmy Butler, and then also drafting Kobe White and Wendell Carter Jr., the most recent moves that we're looking at, as in the ones from the last three years, I would argue look pretty strong, not they wouldn't indicate just looking at those moves that drop off that you described earlier in their team success, where they went from making the playoffs 10 out of 11 years to all of a sudden making it one out of five years. Now it could be that it was a, it was a few years back that they really made the mistakes, right? That it was the the moves like they traded away Gary Harris and Yusuf Nurkic that that's catching up to them now. Um, But I would say even just within the last few years, they actually have made some pretty good moves. Um, yeah. Moving on to our last couple of trades, we've got Taj Gibson, Doug McDermott, and a second round pick that became Mitchell Robinson to the Oklahoma City Thunder for Joffrey Laverne, Anthony Morrow, and Cameron Payne. <laughs> um, I, I forgot, honestly, that, that that pick became Mitchell Robinson, but I guess because that got traded to OKC, and then in the Mellow trade, they traded that pick to the Knicks, I would assume. Uh, could be. I'm not sure. Um, um, yeah. I, I was just. I was just gonna say, like, there's no guarantee that they would have taken Mitchell Robinson at that point in the second round. The second round is always a yeah. little bit of a wild card. Um, but once again, a missed opportunity. Um, but then also, uh, I want to highlight the, the trading away Taj Gibson and Doug McDermott for not that much return. Um, makes like that W that they had in drafting Taj Gibson, not quite as sweet. It makes the trade where they traded away um, Gary Harris and Yusuf Nurkic for Doug McDermott look not as sweet because they didn't even keep Doug McDermott. Um, so they, they didn't yeah. even like reap the benefits of that trade for yeah. very long. Very, very little return. Uh, and in the last trade that we have, the most recent one in the Gar Packs and in terms of like significance is they traded Bobby Portis, Jabari Parker and a 2023 second round pick for Otto Porter. Um, I, I remember this was like a sort of a weird pick for me because everyone was thinking like, Oh yeah, like where's Otto Porter going to get traded because he had like this huge contract, but I didn't expect it would, it would be like the bulls who weren't really like a playoff team because Otto Porter feels kind of like a, like if you're good, you want Otto Porter to make you better. It, it, but, like, Otto Porter is not going to, like, turn a bad team into, like, a pretty good one, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so this is just, like... Eh. I also think this trade is noteworthy more so be- than because of, like, what they gave up or what they got in return. Um, it makes their money situation complicated because that was a really big contract to take on. Um, and that might have been the reason that the, the Wizards were willing to give him up. But this year... Um, he's making $27 million. And next year, he has a player option worth $28.5 million. Um, Which he will accept. <laughs> yes, because he's not going to make that much money the next time you know, he's up for free agency. So, um, I mean, however you want to look at it, that's just a lot of money to be giving a player of, all, of Otto Porter's um, skill set, of his caliber. Um, just that Otto Porter has never and will never be an all-star. Um, he no longer has the potential, really, I would argue, to be an all-star, and you're still paying him that much money. Um, doesn't Tragic. seem very smart to me. But Yeah, and so I guess that's kind of like a, all you need to know, like a crash course in terms of like all the trades and drafting of, of Gar Foreman and John Paxton over the past uh, like 15 years, 10 years. Um, and we've seen that like, there's clearly some – some bad ones, whether it's letting, letting go of uh, Gary Harris, letting go of Yusuf Nurkic, letting go of LaMarcus Aldridge um, and, and getting back or get, letting go of Kyle Korver, letting go of Tyson Chandler, letting go of J.R. Smith. I'm just going down this list. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, just, like, I just couldn't stop. Um, there are a lot of them, like, yeah. yeah uh, but like th- there are a few like good ones back. Like they got like the first round pick that became LaMarcus Aldridge. 
<laughs> even though tra- they traded him away. Um, they, they got rid of Jamal Crawford. Dude, I'm like reliving this list again. Um, but yeah, there were some positives uh, with the drafting. There were some positives with the Jimmy Butler trade. And I think that even if there are like a lot of big negatives, like there are definitely some positives I think NBA fans sh- should keep in mind before sort of like judging guard packs. And I think that will go the same. We're just going to do like a quick sort of crash course on like the free agency or the lack thereof of free agency signings um, with guard packs. Um, and just really talking about like, we jump into yeah, that, what's up? There's just, there's one very important player that they wave that they cut from the team. Um, Spencer Dimwitty. I think they picked him up from free agency um, on, you know, just like a really short term contract, but they proceeded to cut Spencer Dimwitty very quickly afterwards. And now with the hindsight, the context of the player that Spencer Dimwitty has become for the Brooklyn Nets, that doesn't look very good. As in borderline guy, all-star. Exactly. It's another guy that they just gave up for nothing. 20 point per game score. Yeah. Everyone, every NBA team wants a Spencer Dinwiddie. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, pop so yeah, free agents. Yeah. Quick crash course on free agency. Everywhere from 2006 to 2020. I think the main theme here is that Chicago, as opposed to like LA or New York, two things. First, compared to LA and New York, they don't get as many big names and they're not, they're not even like considered to get like as many like big names. Like, like Chicago is like kind of considered to get LeBron to like kind of considered to get Carmelo Anthony, but like that's kind of it in terms of like big names over the past few years. Um, I do think Chicago was the runner up to Carmelo Anthony though. Um, or maybe no, that was the, the Nets. I, I think oh, it was sorry. the runner I meant, up I to meant, LeBron. Sorry. I meant LeBron. I meant LeBron. I don't know why I yeah. said Carmelo. Um, as in after the heat, the next, the next biggest, um, choice would have been the uh uh, the chicago bulls Bulls. yeah but i I would say outside of that there has been kind it's it's kind of been barren for the past 15 years whereas like if you hear like a big name it's always like oh is he going to new york is he going to uh la is he going to dallas is he going to miami it's almost never is he going to chicago not not to say that's never because lebron was the thing but it's almost never chicago and i i think that's the first thing and the second thing is when they do get big names to come to Chicago it's big names not big performances because it's big names that used to be that used to be big time talents that used to be all-stars they used to be all NBA players but they're no longer that um, for example they, they took in uh, Ben Wallace in 2006 he was a like a four-time defense player of the year and for the first five years up until when they signed him in, in 2006, so like 2001, 2005. He was an all-star all five years of that. The Bulls sign him, and he never becomes an all-star again. <laughs> and, and, and to be – It's worth he was, saying – He was only in Chicago for, for two years. What were you saying? I, I was going to say, I think the Pistons won the championship in 2004. Um, and so this is only two years removed from that in 2006. But probably the biggest mistake was – offering him a four-year contract two years after he'd already won the championship. Because in theory, he wins the championship in his prime. Where I don't know how old he was. Let's say he was 30 years old. So two years after that, he's 32. By the end of that contract, he's going to be like 36. I'm not sure that's how it played out. But two years, if you're signing him two years after his prime on a four-year contract, that's not ideal. That's sort of like the situation that I guess the Sixers are in with Al Horford right now, I would argue. Yeah, I think that's a good comparison, honestly. Although, I still would argue Al Horford is turning out better than Ben Wallace did for the Bulls. Because we're just in the first year, though. We're only in the first yeah. year of Al Horford. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's fair. Because they're going to be paying like they're going to be paying like a thirty-seven-year-old Al Horford like like thirty-five million dollars. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they signed him for four years, sixty million. So that's fifteen million a year. But keep in mind, fifteen million a year back then was like $20 million a year now because the salary cap keeps inflating. So it was a bigger percentage of the salary cap. Um, and they signed him for four years. He only stayed for two. They had to trade him after a while just because it was not working out. He was like this old vet and the rest of the team was pretty young. And it's, there was just kind of a disconnect. Uh, the first year in Chicago was, was bad um, compared to the rest of his career. And then the second year in Chicago was awful. Um, the first year, it, like for context, like in his prime and like towards like the year before he went to the Bulls, uh, his PER was 17. The first year in Chicago was 14. And then the second year 
Chicago is 12. When 12, 12 is below average, 14 is like slightly below average, 15 is average. So he went from an above average player to a below average player. Um, and then he's a four, he's a four time defensive player of the year. And as he's kind of getting like out of his prime a little bit, it, it's starting to his, like his, def, his defensive wind shares, which is like a metric to show like how much of an impact uh, a defender kind of has on the defense. Um, his defensive win shares went from 7.5 in his prime, which was like, which is very good. And then year one in Chicago, it was at 6.5, which is, which is worse, obviously. And then year two, it was at 2.5. Oh man. Yeah. Um, so, and he, he was never like this offensive player. Like you were signing Ben Wallace for his defense. Obviously, and, of course. And they signed Ben Wallace to not play defense and then also to not play offense and then also to mm. get paid $15 million a year. Mm. Um, so that's an L for Garpax. Uh, for sure. I don't know if you, I don't know if you have anything to add, but like, no, you covered that. Yeah. That was just, a, that was kind of an L. Um, another name on, on this list is just in terms of notable signings is in, in 2010, they signed Carlos Boozer. Uh, he was a all-star for the Utah jazz and they signed him for five years. He signed him for five years, like $80 million. And this was an overpay because he, I think he was like a one time all-star in Utah, something like that. And then he came he was to the coming Bulls. off a really good year in Utah. It was like, yeah, he, he had, um, I was just watching a video the other day where it was like at that point that last year in Utah, he was ranked as like a, like, you know, the 25th, fifth best player in the league or something by Bleacher Report. And so that was the player that the Chicago Bulls hoped they would get. And he wasn't bad at Chicago. He just was not a top 25 player in the league or whatever. Yeah. He was they just got like catfish. <laughs> they did get catfish. He, he was kind of just like average, just an okay player, but like, if you're competing for a championship, having an okay player that's being paid like a very good player is crippling to your team to where like they signed him in 2010 and they were competing for a title in 2011 and 2012. And that like $13 million a year is a big enough part of the cap to where let's say they wouldn't be able to trade for that extra piece that they needed to, to beat the Miami heat or something like that in a playoff series. Um, so even if that doesn't sound big, like in order to win a championship, the front office needs to be like precise and careful with every decision. I think that they, they kind of dropped the ball here. Every Another place where they, yeah, every dollar does count, especially when you're paying Dwayne Wade oh. in, t- in 2016, <laughs> <laughs> two years, forty-seven and a half million dollars. Uh, like <laughs> that, I think they just that, wanted to put like they they wanted to put butts in seats, bro. Like I, that's the only way I can explain this one. I mean, if you're really gonna go after the like hometown Chicago kid, go after Anthony Davis or don't trade Derrick Rose for nothing. Why go after a 35 year old Dwayne Wade? It just does not make sense to me. Yeah, and, like and he was he was clearly on the decline. Like 23 million dollars per year, whatever it was. Like that is. A significant chunk of the of the salary cap then and now. Um, that's just not smart. Uh, yeah, and and for context, their their team sunk this year. They they signed him. They had uh, Pau Gasol. They had Rajon Rondo. Mm. It it was just it it wasn't it. And this signing, everyone knew this signing right away was just bad. Of you know, um, it felt wrong for my for Dwayne to leave the Heat. It felt super wrong for. Chicago Bulls to overpay for him like this yeah um like before they signed him Wade's Wade's PER had gone down like every season for the past five years um and so like he was clearly he was clearly on the on the decline uh and for the previous four years oh yeah yeah go ahead just to his credit when Dwayne Wade I don't I don't think it was I think it was like in the last year of this contract the same contract or something he ended up back on the heat that last year on the Heat actually wasn't bad. He had some really great moments back on the Heat, including that game winner where he got blocked and then threw it back up. So yeah, his numbers actually were better that year after he yeah. returned to Miami from the Bulls. I mean, maybe it's just he's, he belongs in Miami. But like the the what we're looking at here is how Garpax is affecting the Bulls. Exactly. And they they signed this man for a huge for a huge contract to to like decrease in production and honestly like there's one thing to be like oh yeah he he had like knee problems whatever whatever but like they went out of their way to sign him when he had been on the decline for the past five years his PER had gone down every season for the past five years his offensive win 
win shares, a metric like that measures offensive impact. His, his offensive win shares had gone down for the past four seasons, um, just like from like two, three, four to like a point four. I, I honestly um, just think this is, this is a signing that we all NBA fans will seek to forget ever happened. Um, or just choose to not remember that Dwayne Wade ever played anywhere besides Miami. It'll be, it'll be the Hakeem Olajuwon on the Raptors. It'll be the, <laughs> it'll be the Jordan on the Wizards. It'll be the Pippen on the Blazers. It'll be the Patrick Ewing on the Magic or Patrick Ewing on the Supersonics. Um, mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, All right. Yeah. But let's go on to uh, Pau Gasol in 2014. Um, this is just another quick example of a guy that was no longer in his prime. This is after Chicago, uh, Pau Gasol had been on some – had been a really a key piece on some uh, second go around Lakers team, Lakers teams for Kobe um, to win a couple more chips. Um, but even a few years after that, Pagasol, Pagasol is no longer a young in. Um, so in 2014, him, yeah, I mean, not the end of the world. Pagasol wasn't bad for the Bulls, but another one of those like big names, maybe, but probably no longer a big talent as you put it um anymore yeah the same the same thing then goes for the next guy we have here in rip hamilton um in 2011 um he was a former big name for the pistons very big they literally repeated their ben wallace mistake um i don't i don't (laughs) i don't know how big the contract was i don't it was definitely not the same 15 million dollars a year for four years they gave ben wallace but Literally the same 2004 championship Detroit Pistons team. They, they signed another guy from that, hoping it would be a difference maker, and it was not. Um, and so this is seven years later that they're signing Rip Hamilton. Um, I'm not sure how old Rip Hamilton was, but again, not a youngin. Yeah, and so just as a trend, Garpax failed to attract a big-name free agents, except when they do, it's big-name, not big talent. And so I think I think that might be the biggest area of weakness thus far in the Garpax movement is if you're given like like I, this will be understand this will be understandable if the, if we're talking about like the the vice president and the GM for like the Grizzlies or like the the Pelicans or like the Bucks like small market teams like good good organizations is just small teams but you're in the third biggest market in the United States. Um, actually. I, I just looked on basketball reference to Gar Pax's credit. Um, I was a little bit wrong about the Pau Gasol signing, even though Pau he's Gasol a, he's was a one-time 30, all-star, right? He was 34 years old, but in the two years he spent on the bulls, he was an all-star both years um, and averaged, I think like 18 and then 16. Uh, yeah. 18 and a half and then 16 and a half. So to their credit, actually the Pau Gasol signing while brief and while he was old actually worked out really well. Because those were two more quality years in Pau Gasol's impressive career. Yeah. Okay. And so, as we said, Garb Hacks, no big names. When it's big names, it's not big talent. I think that's personally doing research. That's their biggest flaw, in my opinion. Um, Mm -hmm. Just talking about coaching real quick, their coaching hires. There was nothing really exceptional uh, about, like, any of them except for Tom Thibodeau. Uh, They had Bill Cartwright in for a little bit. They had Scott guys in for a little bit they had uh like like del negro in for a little bit but then john paxton apparently like punched him so there's that um and then they, they had uh Thibodeau for a little bit and he was a good hire um good defense he was here he, he did win coach of the year yeah um but <laughs> there's always the question did he like play his players too hard why was he playing derrick rose at the end of that game where he tore his ACL against, I think, the 76ers. I mean, in case you know what we're talking about, they were like, it was like a 20 point blowout that the Bulls were, I think, winning in um, yeah. with like five minutes left in the fourth quarter. And, and Derek Rose was still playing, tore his ACL for the first time. And that was the beginning of his downward spiral. So a lot of people say, and, and Tibbs had this reputation that he would play his best players far too many minutes for their own good, for their own health. Yeah. And so. I don't, I don't really know if that reflects like that good or that bad on guard packs, but I feel like we should just mention it. Mm. And then just overall, like for the past like 10, 15 years of, of guard packs, just to put it in perspective, there, there were kind of like two eras 
the first era is from like 2005 to 2015 where they made the playoffs 10 out of 11 seasons. Um, and I think there was a lot of successes, even if they like missed some draft picks, had some bad trades, they still put together teams that were playoff playoff teams. Um, however, I think maybe some of the discontent for the Bulls is like they can't look back and recall like the glorious moments outside of the Derrick Rose MVP season. And that's more like attachment to like Derrick Rose than to like the team, you know, um, because in, in out of those 10 times that they made the playoffs from 2000 five 2015 they made one conference finals appearance and they lost in the first round six out of those 10 times so it, it like a lot of times they were kind of just like in the middle of the pack like kind of just like get beaten four two in round one um and even in that conference finals they lost four once the heat so it, it like there was never really an opportunity where they were like a finals team you know The only other thing I would say about the coaches um, before we move on from their history to their future um, is that they fired Fred Hoiberg um, only, I think, like last year or the year before for Jim Boylan. Um, And obviously we know that that today, basically the entire league knows that Jim Boylan is only going to last so long because he has been a horrible horrible mistake as as head coach of the Chicago Bulls um but but the the biggest criticism I would have um in firing Fred Hoiberg is that Fred Hoiberg was not the same coach that Tibbs was he never became a coach of the year or really even in that conversation the Bulls weren't particularly good with Fred Hoiberg as their head coach but you have to question um was that Fred Hoiberg's fault or was that Gar Pax's fault I I I would argue because I would good teams in in front of Fred Hoiberg. They didn't give him good rosters. And not only did they not give him good teams, they didn't give him good teams that fit his style of coaching, right? Mm, because right either well. I, they, I'm pretty sure they hired Fred Hoiberg from Iowa State. And Fred Ho- Hoiberg's style is space and pace. It's lots of threes. It's run and gun. It's, it's like kind of a more modern offense, um, which I think was why he probably deserves to be hired again somewhere in the league. But it, it's a lot of shooting, a lot of threes. And uh, personally, I think, like, that's kind of what Kenny Atkinson did. But, like, it's kind of a dual, dual parallel system uh, with the Nets. And so, meanwhile, they sign Fred Hoiberg. They bring in Dwayne Wade. And they bring in Rajon <laughs> Rondo. And they bring in Rajon Rondo and Pau Gasol. And so you have your best player being a 35-year-old big man who is never athletic or, like, fast. Um, and then you have your point guard not being able to shoot threes like like a a mid prime mid to late prime rondo like literally every year of rajan rondo until maybe this year he's been a, he's been an abysmal three point shooter and then Dwayne Wade was not like this good three point shooter either so you have like probably your three three out of your four best players not including Jimmy Butler um three out of your four best players like are co- the complete opposite of what your coach's system is yeah. So that I, that is the only true fault that I see for Gar Pax in terms of like coaching, and that's and, more just roster management. I, and I would say, if you're going to fire Fred Hoiberg, who I would argue is not a bad coach, he had a good relationship with the players, it has pretty good X's and O's. You better have a damn good replacement, <laughs> and we know they did not have that. Um, Jim Boylan has been anything but he basically has no respect from any of the players and has no X's and O's whatsoever. Um, And so I think that that pretty much takes us to today, to how we got to the end of the Garpax era. And so let's talk pretty briefly about where do the Bulls go from here? Um, I think we just talked about continuing this coaching talk. I think the obvious first step is they have to fire Jim Boylan with the change in management. I think to put it pretty plainly, um, this going through doing the research for all of this makes me think that Gar Pax has made their mistakes. They've also done some pretty good things. I, but I think that the, the biggest difference has been the coaching. I think that like when they had Tom Thibodeau, who had his group of guys that, that fit his style of coaching really well, and when Tom Thibodeau was fit for what was at the, that time the modern NBA, the Bulls are winning games. I think that, Chicago, uh, that, that uh, Tom Thibodeau's system 
became outdated. I think that when Derrick Rose went down, he just didn't have a team that was as good. And so things started to sort of fall apart. And they've never been as good since because they haven't had a, a team that was as well coached, that had a system and group of players that were, that were fit as well. And so I think that before you even go and blame Gar Pax, the first place that you have to look is, well, they were a pretty good team when you had the coach of the year and when you had a really good roster. So an MVP. Let's, so yeah. So, so, so if we're still waiting for Gar Pax to fix the roster, the first thing we should do is get a new coach with a good relationship with the players and set up a new system. And so I think the way to do that, the first, very first step, even before firing Garpax, I think should have been fire Jim Boylan. Now, there could be a situation where Garpax is attached to Jim Boylan. And so then it would make sense that as soon as the season is over, or as, at least as soon as we know the season isn't coming back in June or whatever, then Jim Boylan's out, but we still have to see. I think completely good. I, I wouldn't have said it better myself. And I would also say that another important thing moving forward is do not make the same mistakes of the past in terms of wh- whether it's Garpax or whether it's uh, the new guy. I'm just going to call him AK because I don't know how to pronounce his name. But I-, I think either way, it's just you cannot sign free agents that are past their prime. Mm. And you cannot acquire big names that are past their prime. I heard one person say like would they go after chris paul and i'm like oh my god like, <laughs> like they're gonna they're gonna do it they're, they're, they're gonna they're gonna carlos boozer them they're, yeah. they're gonna they're gonna pull a carlos boozer a ben wallace a, a whatever so I, I would say number one don't go after old guys especially because you have a young team um your best players are a 25 year old zach levine like a 20 like one i don't know like one year old uh, Lowry and a, and a 20 year old like Wendell Carter like they don't don't do that to yourself um, so I would say be cautious when spending and of course that's that's so easy for me to say right um, but I would just say in like specifically what I what I would try to like focus on is do not spend on big names if their best years are behind them and the way to know their best years are behind them is just don't, just don't go for anyone that's over 30 just don't hmm. Uh, so, so agreeing with what you said, um, I, I think it's pronounced Arturus Karnisovas. That's my attempt. Um, I think that the, that the best thing he should, that he could do is in his first plan of attack should be spend your money re-signing the guys that are already on the roster. Zach Levine and Laurie Markkinen in the next couple of years are both going to be up for big max extensions, max contracts, whatever. Don't let those guys walk. Trade them, do, re-sign them, do whatever. Just get some value for those guys. The last thing you should ever do is let your young talent escape for no return. That's, that's yeah. one trend. Is like, Don't just give Kyle Korver away for money. <laughs> don't just trade Tyson Chandler away for somebody you've nev- we've never heard of. Don't just trade away LaMarcus Aldridge for Tyrus Thomas before you ever saw LaMarcus Aldridge play on your team. Keep the young guys that you have, let them grow together in a system. And then once you've seen them play, once you've experimented a little bit, then make decisions. So first of all, I would say, just keep Zach Levine, keep Laurie Markin on the books. Then once you've established a system, once you've hired a new coach, once you've set up a team and you think you're ready to go win, then that's when you get aggressive and maybe you do sign somebody that might be a little bit past their prime. Somebody that, that's, that, as you said, is a big name, maybe not so much of a big skill set. But if you sign a 35-year-old Dwayne Wade or a Carlos Boozer or a Pau Gasol or whoever, like if somebody who only has, maybe if we were using a Pau Gasol example, if he's 34 years old, but he still has two all-star years of 17 points per game left in the tank, you'll take that if your team is ready to win. You don't want that if you still have – Laurie Markin, who isn't, who just has like no confidence at this point. You got to let your guys figure out what they're doing before you go out and sign those vets. So I wouldn't say that never sign guys who are past their prime, but don't get aggressive in spending that money on older guys until you're sure that you can win now. Yeah. And I think that just in general, going outside of the Bulls, I think with developing teams that are like bad, um, the most important thing is continuity, right? Because we've seen it on both ends. We've seen it on the, on the disaster end where 
um, I think it was Kyrie Irving, but the main, but the main example I u- use is because I was an NBA diehard when it, when this has been happening is the Phoenix Suns because Devin Booker ha- has been in the league what this is his fourth year and he's had five head coaches and I do you not think that if if Devin Booker had one head coach even if he's not the best head coach if he had one head coach one front office one system from day one that he would one, be a better player, two, be a better leader, and three, the team around him would grow out of him because he was familiar with the environment as the best player. I think that, that's the main thing to go with. I, I really agree with that point about continuity. I would say establish continuity once you've gotten rid of Boylan, though. As in, fire yes. Jim Boylan and then establish your continuity. So whatever our coach you end up with, if we're going with your point of like, even if they're not the best coach in the world, just hang on to them because you'd rather just have consistency than start afresh and then have another guy where you're not sure. Like you, and so if the guy you have is average, don't risk it all and, and have a chance of having somebody that's going to be God awful. Just like stick with what's average for now. Right. Do you, um, do you have any coaching suggestions or is it just anyone but Boylan? Obviously, it's not anybody but Boylan. There, there are coaches out there in college, assistants, whatever, that are going to be as bad as Boylan has been. So don't just go with anybody. You have to do your due, your due diligence. Um, so I do think it's important to make sure that whatever coach they hire next is going to be one that is the coach of their future, um, the coach that, that can grow as, uh, with the team that Art- um, Arturis, Carni, Sovas builds. Um, in terms of who that would be, you don't. I'm you don't have really to give me a name. Just, just like for me, just like stylistically, like, like what, like what would they be good at coaching? Um, I, I think they should be missing Fred Hoiberg a little bit right now. I don't think they should necessarily go back and hire Fred Hoiberg. Um, but the the style of play that you described, the like pace and spaced, um, you know, fast paced. Uh, running gun kind of kind of style I think would fit their their young guys pretty well um, Kobe White Zach Levine Laurie Markin and Wendell Carter Jr. they can run a sort of small ball lineup that plays good defense all while being a um, high energy runs transition takes a lot of threes um, attacks the basket well like just like I don't know how to put it other than you know like, like a lot of energy and a lot of scoring um, yeah, I think that's good in general for young teens, but especially when your starting backcourt is Kobe White, who's exactly. one of the fastest players in the league already, and Zach Levine, who's one of the, if, who's probably the most explosive player in the league, at like, least on not? dunks, but also just quick in general. I would argue like the the Sacramento Kings offense of last year could potentially fit this um, Bulls team pretty well, um, and I think even if you have a system that like doesn't emphasize defense at all. I think Wendell Carter Jr. is going to be a good enough defender in the next year or two that he can just kind of make up for that himself. And then you should also have Chris Dunn coming off the bench, probably behind Kobe White, um, so that if you're getting exposed defensively here or there, Chris Dunn might not score a single point, but at least we know he's going to clamp up. Yeah. Um, And so I guess the last sort of area is – or the last two areas, I, w- I would say for trades, I would say don't go aggressive. There, there's a pathway where they could trade for like a, a big name by like doing like a, like their own pick and then doing like auto porter as a, as a contract filler and then adding maybe like maybe like a, a not a Kobe White but like 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 a Chris Dunn or like still like some sort of young piece. I would advise against that because you're still young. Why try? Why, why trade for a Pau Gasol when your team is still bad? Um, like, like why, why go for a player when you're still not going to be a top four team in the East either way? Um, so that would be my last sort of piece of advice for, for the trade aspect. Um, and then just looking forward to the draft, just, I guess we're kind of just doing all areas of, of GMing, of general managing. Um, I would say for the draft, they're probably going to have like the eighth pick I would say that they've had the, well, the seventh pick for the last three years. Um, so let's just say they get the seventh pick. Work with I, would go, yeah. I would go for – like I don't have the names off the top of my head. I don't think Anthony Edwards would be on the board at, at then. But I would say 
go for someone that's a wing, first of all, because you, you have a point guard, uh, you have a center. So I would just say go for someone that's a wing. Um, and preferably you can shoot, but that's always like an, I, I, an ideal scenario. But I would just say go for a wing because I think you're at this point where you have enough young guys to where you should try to let them develop and you shouldn't be uh, overlapping at positions. Um, I, I think I, I would say um, the, the biggest thing I would say about the draft is just draft, like keep your own pick. Just like why not just draft another young guy, add somebody else to the team. Um, because I don't think any, next year should be anything except another um, extended experiment. As in, I, I, I would hope that this team, because I, I sort of thought they would be on the brink of the playoffs this year, if not in the playoffs. Um, I think they could do that next year. But first, they should just like let what they have play out. Um, and so I would say the best way to do that is just like draft your own pick. Let the, t- let the Otto Porter Jr. contract expire before you start pushing for a win now. Let things free themselves up naturally. You'll, you'll know hopefully by then, is Chris Adon this like potentially franchise guy? Is Kobe White that? Is Laurie Markin the player we're seeing this year or the player that we saw last year? Can Zach Levine actually lead you to any wins? I think a lot of questions that the Bulls have are going to answer themselves if they let this thing ride out. Um, the best way to do that, I think, is just like slow down, draft your own pick, um, let Arturis Carcinovonas, Kers- whatever, I, I don't know how to pronounce that, settle this. Um, and I think it'll play out. Um, the one thing I want to say about him, the new guy, um, it, that who is replacing, um, I, I think, I think he's replacing John Paxson as the new vice president of basketball operations. And for now, Gar Fordman is still the GM until they hire a new GM. He reminds me a little bit of the Atlanta Hawks coming in, um, in grabbing the Warriors old guy, um, to come like build them a team that looks like the Warriors. They're doing that, except they're grabbing the Nuggets XGM. Um, so I, I think they might try to like build something Nuggets esque. Um, and so I, I kind of like that. I, I, I think he's going to bring something new and exciting. And, and so if you're really going to start a new era of Chicago Bulls basketball, give him the, give him the reins like through and through. Um, yeah, I yeah, don't know. That was a, a, that was a roundabout tangent, but shout out to the the Hawks as well. <laughs> yeah. Nice year. Um, yeah, but th- that's a good observation. And honestly, if you're talking about well built teams that kind of just come out of nowhere, Denver Nuggets are one of them. Um, they they traded for Gary Harris and for Yusuf Nurkic mm. from the from the Bulls, uh, and I, I just think that that's a very good model. And I'm I'm a little bit surprised he left, but the our, our tourists left, but because the Nuggets is a really good situation, but like anywhere with the top three market, like, like why not? So that's, that's why Masai Ujiri said, uh, come to the next, you know, <laughs> fingers crossed. We haven't lost hope yet. Yeah. Um, so th- those are, those are our thoughts. I-, I would say, do you have anything else to say on the topic of Gar packs on the topic of what they've done in the past on the topic of what this might mean for the future? Um, I would just say that that I'm hopeful that one of the most storied franchises the NBA has um, will will continue to add to their strong legacy, and that the Arturis Carcinova, Car- Carnesovas um, era is going to be that. Um, but whatever happens, I think it will be interesting, and I'm looking forward to it as an NBA fan. Yeah, agreed. Um, so yeah, we in this episode we just talked about. The first kind of period from 2005 to 2015 where, uh, where Gar Foreman and John Paxson made the playoffs 10 out of 11 seasons, six first-round neg- exits, and then the Derrick Rose MVP season where they got to the conference finals. They had, they had a lot of ups and downs uh, through the draft, through trades, through free agency especially. Uh, and then even from 2016 to 2020, it's kind of gone downhill with the reign of, with the reign of Jim Boylan and – even if they have some good draft picks, Bulls fans aren't used to losing. So that's why there's been some discontent and that's why there's being a, a front office move. All right. So thank you so much for listening to this episode of Space Level 4 NBA podcast. We hope you enjoyed this Zoom edition. Uh, this will be on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. So like and subscribe and, and leave a review. 
uh, on on Apple Podcasts and on YouTube. And we hope you enjoyed. Um, follow us on Instagram at Space the Floor Podcast and on Twitter at Space the Floor. We've been really active there recently. And thank you so much. My name is Connor Gillan. And I'm Connor Flannery. And see you next time. Peace. Shout out to everyone besides Jim Boylan. <laughs>